Well, good afternoon. The readings of today seem to be on very different tracks, like each of them going in a different direction. For example, the first reading, which is the pre-Christian Book of Wisdom, speaks about the immortality of man. And then the second reading, the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, it speaks about the generous heart of a Christian, supplying the needs for one another, the, tr the true nature of Christian charity. And then in the Gospel, we see two different stories that seem to be separate from one another. And the first uh, story, the main story, is the rising of a young girl who happens to be the daughter of the synagogue official. And then another story is squeezed in the middle of this larger story, and that's the one of a woman who is literally bleeding to death. So as I kept reading and rereading this particular gospel passage from Mark, I realized that there was one common detail with, between the two of them, and that is number 12. Number 12. The young girl that died and that Jesus resuscitated, she was 12 years old. And then the woman that touched the garment of Jesus had been bleeding to death for 12 years. So that's the common thing, 12. What does it mean 12 in the Bible? In the Bible, 12 means completeness, wholeness, totality, perfection. It appears many times in the scriptures. The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, the 12 months of the year, the 12 baskets of fragments after feeding the 5,000, and even in modern times, the 12 step program. Now imagine, that girl was 12 years old. Her life was just beginning. By 12, she probably had completed her childhood as she was becoming a youth into a woman. And suddenly, the wholeness, the completeness, the perfection of life that was growing in her was taken away from her by death. We even know the name of her father, Jairus. Just think of him and of his wife. They must have been important members of their local community as he was the synagogue official. He was not an average Joe. They probably had everything in people's eyes. And yet, while having everything, they were losing their daughter. At that moment, does it even matter to be a prestigious family, to have a solid bank account, or to have the latest horse and chariot? They were losing everything because they were losing their daughter, their 12-year-old daughter. She was the one dying in the story, but I am sure that mom and dad also felt like dying. My daughter is at the point of death, Lord Jesus. Please, come, lay your hands on her so that she might get well and live. And then we have the other story of the woman who was losing her life for 12 years, the one that touched the garment of Jesus. We have to remember that in the Bible, blood was what contained life. So literally, your life runs through your veins. And this woman, since she was losing so much blood for so many years, she had seen her own life vanish, her life being poured out for 12 years. It's like dying slowly. And not only that, she has lost everything, even her money in useless doctors. If I but touch his clothes, I shall be healed, she said to herself. 
The book of wisdom says, God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. For God formed man to be imperishable, the image of his own nature, he made him. What did Jesus do when he raised that 12-year-old girl? What did Jesus do as he unknowingly cured the woman who touched him? In these two passages, Jesus did the most beautiful act of charity. Charity is love. Love is charity. And the most beautiful act of charity is to give life. Think of Jairus and his wife as they saw their daughter being restored to life, to their family life. Imagine the joy that they were experiencing. Think of the woman who no longer had to deal with doctors, nor that she had to worry about bleeding to death. Now finally living, living for once to the fullest. Life is the kind of stuff that we cannot buy with money. At the end of the day, being rich is in relation to what we value. So what do we value? Things or life? In this way, the second reading of today makes perfect sense. Because the life of a Christian is a life of charity. A charitable person gives life, not death. As Christians, we practice charity not as giving a handout, but as giving life, dignity, respect. This is how we honor one another as Christians. We supply for each other's needs, not just because it's nice, but because we want to give life to others. The most beautiful act of charity is to give life. A charitable Christian gives life even when he or she is not even aware. Notice that when Jesus was giving life to this woman, he didn't know. He didn't know that she was getting life as she was touching the garment of Jesus. A charitable Christian gives life even unknowingly. Because that's what a charitable person does, always gives life. The opposite of that is a toxic person. Have you ever met a toxic person? The kind of person that sucks the life out of you, like a parasite. That's what sin does to us. But on the contrary, when you are in the presence of a person of charity, you know it, because that person gives life. Life is the kind of stuff that you can't buy with money. At the end of the day, being rich is only in relation to what we value. So what do we value? Things or life?